screen is the AQI value as well as the concentration that was recorded on June 21st, 2020. Now, on June 21st, 2020, the EMA recorded the highest concentration of particulate matter since we started monitoring. The concentration of particulate matter or very fine dust is represented by this acronym that you see here, PM10, which means particulate matter that is smaller than or less than 10 micrometers. And on that particular day at the station in Tobago, the PM10 or very fine dust particle concentration was 294. Now to put that into context, the air quality standard for that particular pollutant is 75. So it means that on June 21st, 2020, at the air quality monitoring station in Tobago, we measured a concentration of dust in the air that was almost four times the acceptable limit. Notice that this corresponded to an AQI value of 485, which is color coded dark purple, representing hazardous conditions. Now this historical event was directly related to the presence of Saharan dust in the atmosphere. So some persons may be wondering, what is Saharan dust and how does it affect air quality? The Saharan dust um, plume or the Saharan air layer, as it is also referred to, is a giant cloud of thick dust that blows across the ocean all the way from the Saharan desert. And that is found in North, Northern Africa. Now this passage of dust is an annual occurrence and it's as a result of wind currents which transport the dust from the Saharan desert in Northern Africa or across the Atlantic. Now it typically forms between late spring and early autumn, but it peaks in late June to mid August. Now what makes the June 2020 Saharan dust event so noteworthy is how dense it was. Now, these clouds of Saharan dust are usually barely noticeable and can't always be seen on satellite images. But this particular cloud was clearly visible on satellite images. And we need to remember that these satellites are a million miles from the Earth. So the image that you see on your screen is an image from the Sentinel satellite. And this particular satellite is dedicated to monitoring air pollution. The image shows the spread of the Saharan dust westward across the Atlantic Ocean on June 19, 2020. Notice how large this cloud is and also how vivid the image is. So researchers believe that the June 2020 dust plume had the highest concentration of dust particles that has been observed in over 50 to 60 years. And our monitoring at our stations also correspond with these results. Now I have a small one minute animation that I'd like to share with you, which shows the spread of Saharan dust moving up, moving westward across the Atlantic Ocean from June 1st to June 26th. As you look at this animation, you would notice the dense concentration of dust can be seen traveling approximately 8,000 kilometers and arriving near the Caribbean and making its way all across to the United States.
now over the past over the past few months especially month of june the heron dust has gotten a very bad reputation since it poses a threat to our health and also causes hazy skies and triggers air quality warnings but we also have to remember that the saharan dust plays an important role in our ecosystem because this dust is a major source of nutrients which provides food for marine life it's essential for life in the amazon and most importantly the dry dusty air layers suppress the formation of hurricanes and storms in the atlantic so although it it causes health effects it's, there are also some benefits the presence of saharan dust in the atmosphere now during my presentation i mentioned that the ema has air quality monitoring stations which are sited at various locations within trinidad and tobago so i will now hand you over to my colleague nishadi grant who will discuss this in greater detail thank you trina and good afternoon everyone so where do we get the data to generate an air quality index value? As Trina would have mentioned, the measured concentrations are obtained from equipment we call ambient air quality monitoring stations. The equipment draws and samples air to measure pollutant concentrations. So let's take a look at the pictures on the slide. So the picture to the left illustrates the station set up at Tobago and the picture on the right illustrates the station set up in Trinidad. The Tobago station is a, is a larger, more traditional walk-in shelter, whereas the setup in Trinidad is more compact and has a smaller footprint. Though the both stations are different in configuration, the analyzers within each unit are based on the same operating and measurement principles. All the equipment and methodologies we use within our national network are designed to produce the most accurate measurement data. For example, we use US EPA approved equipment methods, methodologies, and equipment. So at each station, we have pollutants measured. Pollutants measured. Six criteria of pollutants are measured at each station. The criteria of pollutants are the most common pollutants that are found in the atmosphere as a result of man-made activity. They are the most common byproduct of transportation and industrial activity, which are known for the impacts on human health. The pollutants include particulate matter of two sizes. So we have particulate matter of diameter less than or equal to 10 micrometers, which is abbreviated to be PM10, and we also have particulate matter less than or equal to 2.5 micrometers, which is abbreviated to PM2.5. So let's put the size of these particles into perspective. So we have a um, picture here showing the width of a hair strand. The picture shows that the PM10 particle can fit into the width of a hair strand five times and the PM 2.5 particle can fit into the width of the hair strand 20 times. Let's think about the size also, let's think about the size of a single sand grain on the beach. The diagram here shows that it is 90 micrometers and PM 10 can fit into this nine times. Other pollutants that are measured at the stations are sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and ozone. So we have our ambient air quality monitoring stations located at along the Beetham Highway at Wasser's Wastewater Treatment Plant. We also have a station located at Point Lisa's Industrial Estate. And we have a, a station at Signal Hill, Tobago. Our national ambient air quality monitoring network is expanding and two new stations will be added later on this year at locations in San Fernando and Arima. In the future, we will also have more stations which will be added as funding becomes available. How is the AQI reported to the public? 
the public can access the national AQI on the EMA's Air Quality Management Information System website, which we abbreviate as the AQMIS website. This AQMIS website can be accessed to our EMA's website, and now I'm going to perform a demo of the AQMIS website for you. So this is um, EMA's website homepage, and as we scroll down, we will see the National Air Quality Index icon. When we click on this icon, this will take us directly to the AQMIS website. Okay, so this is the home page of the AQMIS website, and it provides us with three links to three dashboards. So we have the AQI dashboard, we have the monitoring dashboard, and we also have the monitor stations dashboard. The AQI dashboard, to the top right hand corner, you can see here that there's a legend displaying six AQI categories. And it also shows here that the gray represents that there's insufficient data to generate an AQI value. The AQI dashboard allows the viewing of three types of AQI data from each station. So we have current, forecast, and historical. Each station can be viewed as you scroll down, with Point Lisa being the first, Port of Spain being the second, and Tobago being the third. The current AQI that is displayed on the dashboard for each station is driven by the pollutant, which has the highest concentration. So let's look at Point Lisas, for example. Right now, at this point in time, PM 2.5 is measuring the highest concentration at the Point Lisa station, with an AQI of 105 in the unhealthy for sensitive group category. Next to this AQI gives us a health advisory, which is applicable to whichever group of persons. So the group of persons who are, this advisory is applicable to are sensitive groups, which includes older adults, children, and persons with respiratory ailments and allergies. The, ad, the advice is to reduce prolonged and heavy exertion. So as we go under the AQI tab, we see a breakdown of the AQI value, so the pollutants. At this point in time, ozone has an AQI value of nine, and SO2 has an AQI value of two. Under the health tab, it shows the health advisory broken down by pollutants. And the last two tabs gives us the last 24 hour AQI values under the chart, it gives us a bar, bar, bar chart or bar graph showing the hourly AQI value. And under the grid, it provides the data via tabular format. Under historical, you are able to select any day, any parts where you can if you're able to obtain the AQI value. So let's select a date here. So let's go back to June. The 20 seconds. And we'll be able to see that the overall AQI value for June 20 seconds was 124, but the pollutant that was being measured the highest was PM10. This was in the group for unhealthy to sensitive groups. Also, you can click on the AQI tab here and you will see a breakdown on that day of what the AQI was for the different pollutants measured at the station. We have a day-to-day -day chart and also a day-to-day -day grid, which provides, provides us with periods. 
So you can select. So if you want to see what the AQI value was daily for the past week from the 22nd of June, you can select that. Or if you wanted to see two weeks, you can also select that. And it will be generated. So we see from the 22nd of June, the, a, the highest AQI value was 124. And two weeks prior to that, the so June 8th, it was driven by PM10, which was which had a 50, a, a AQI value of 50. Our other monitoring, our other dashboards, which would be the monitoring dashboard, it shows us average pollutants concentrations for periods. And our monitor station dashboard provides basic station information and current meteorological conditions. So this is the end of our demo. And we'll head back to the presentation. Also, soon enough, our AQ, the AQI value will be available via AQI app. Currently, the EMA is partnering with Intelligence Application to develop an AQI application, which will be made available free to the public to download on your mobile devices. The application will be launched in August 2020 and will allow persons to have access to the real-time AQI value at your fingertips and on the go. As the AQI value increases, the level of health concern also increases and changes. Persons who are highly susceptible, even in the moderate category, are sensitive and unusually sensitive population. For example, babies, elderly persons, and persons with pre-existing health conditions. For example, persons with respiratory ailments or pre-existing conditions of heart disease. So what do you do when the AQI is unhealthy or hazardous? It is advised that you stay indoors, you avoid exercising or working outdoors for long periods, choose a less strenuous outdoor activity, and postpone outdoor recreational and non-mandatory activities. The population will be informed of extreme air pollution events, via the EMA's website or our social media platforms. Also, you'll be the public will be informed through mainstream media, television, radio, and the newspapers. When there, there are increased levels of particulate matter due to the occurrence of Saharan dust, the EMA releases notifications to the public via our media pages. So this brings us to the end of our presentation, and we'll hand it back to Matthew, who will host the Q&A session. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and a thank you again for being with us. Those of you who have just joined us, we will be entertaining the question and answer period at this moment. Um, but you please to mute your mics so that we would not have any kind of feedback. And one of the first questions that we were asked was, do you use our local limits to calculate the AQI? Hi, so yes, we do use our air pollution rule standards for the calculation of the AQI. So our um, air quality index software was the, the equation used to do that conversion was actually modified to ensure that it considers our air pollution rule standards. Okay, thank you very much, Trina. Um, we have another question. Um, what is the current air quality um, July today on July 14th, 2020? 
where is the new Tobago station to be sited? And um, Flagstaff, Charlottesville would be good. Do you test for DDT, bacteria, et cetera? Okay, so the current air quality for Point Lisas, as we would have seen in the demo, was 105 for PM10. And the Tobago station is sited at uh, Signal Hill Secondary School. So we have um, two new stations that are coming on stream at the end of this year. And those two new stations would be sited in Trinidad. So it would be at Arima and the other one would be at San Fernando. So currently we only have one station in Tobago, which is at Signal Hill. And we would be considering um, a second location in the future once funding is available. And we currently test only for the criteria pollutants that was um, listed, particulate matter, PM10 and PM2.5, carbon monoxide, ozone, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide. Okay. Thank you for that explanation, Trina and Shadi. Um, the other question that has just popped up is, besides all the attention being placed on Sahara dust, do you monitor air quality in areas that are prone to bushfires or in communities where people engage in backyard fires to be for refuge or for refuse? So our air monitoring stations are sited at specific locations and the stations are located in such a way that we get, we are trying to locate them in areas that um, we have a criteria where that we cite our stations. Now these stations are not uh, as portable. Uh, from the pictures, you would see that it's, it's some shelters, like the one in Tobago is actually permanent, permanently sited on a, in a structure. So they cannot just move around to measure or look at bushfires. However, if there are fires within the vicinity or it's in the areas where these stations are located, we will see uh, particular pollutants rising. Thank you, Trina. Our next question, do our air pollution standards provide for the protection of public health? Local limits for PM 2.5 is 65 UG M3, whereas the WHO recommends 15 for protection of public health. Yes. So our air pollution rules, when the limits were considered, it did consider the protection for, for public health because our standards are primary standards and primary standards are specifically for the protection of uh, for health. The local limit for PM2.5 is 65 micrograms per meter cube and currently the EMA is looking at amending its rules and that is one of the standards we are considering. However, it should be noted that the World Health Organization standard of 15 micrograms per meter cube is a recommendation and it is based on a standard where persons, um, the epidemiological studies used to develop this standard shows a level where persons will start or begin to experience health effects and it relates to the most sensitive individuals. So such a, a standard of 15 has not yet been adopted by any country worldwide because it's a very stringent standard. However, we are currently considering uh, our PM 2.5 level. Thank you, Trina. Next question. Air pollution exists as a mixture of substances. People do not breathe in one pollutant at a time. How do you account for the mixture? I agree, um, air pollution is a mixture, but um, as was mentioned in the presentation, with the air pollution index, it, can, it is driven by the pollutant that is, um, that would result in the greatest impact to health. So, and we need to remember the context of the AQI and the, the parameters that are measured. So what it's telling us currently, for example, at the Point Lisa station, PM 2.5, it's telling us that that is the 
the air pollutant currently in the atmosphere that would result in uh, health impacts to those that are highly sensitive because it's actually code orange right now. Okay, and I think I can mention this question and the person who has posed it. This is from Glenn Goddard, who is a former technical manager here at the EME. Um, Glenn says, thank you for your presentation, great progress, and thank you for sharing this with the public. Do you have any studies on whether indoor air quality is really better in open TNT houses? No, we do not have any um, studies on indoor air, if indoor air quality is really better than in open TNT yeah, so then we also need to remember that uh, within the EMA or air pollution rules really refers to ambient air quality and hence no uh, studies done on indoor air quality at this time. Thank you. Another question. Would you say that communities where quarries operate um, should be, just a minute, the question has just gone away from me. Let me just take another until. When do you plan on existing, on extending the type of tests other than carbon monoxide, etc., to include DDT, DDT and other bacterial particulates? These are critical for bacterial infections and other sensitivities to DDT and other chemicals. Yes, so I agree that those um, other chemicals are also uh, very important. But for the purpose of an air quality index, you would find that um, it's only related to those criteria pollutants. And the types of tests that you're recommending are more uh, lab-based. And so we, the EMA would test for certain things when the need arises, and we will do certain studies. But for the context of this presentation and the AQI, the parameters that are currently measured are those that are measured internationally that relates to an air quality index. Thank you, Trina. Another question, would you say that communities where quarries operate should be given a level of priority in terms of establishing a station for the monitoring of particulate matters? Okay, so currently um, we have three stations. And as Trina would have mentioned, we select the location to site these monitors according to population density, um, the location of um, sensitive receptors, etc. The way we are dealing with residential communities where quarries operate, we are trying to increase our compliance with the air pollution rules. So in that way, we can be emissions from the quarries can be managed through the air pollution rules. Yes, and also in addition to the air pollution rules, we also have the Certificate of Environment Appearance rules that once, um, once a quarry holds such a certificate or permit, that they may also include air monitoring, uh, ambient air quality monitoring as part of those conditions. And so those are additional ways in which we um, look at air pollution in Trinidad and Tobago. In perspective of air monitoring, what are the major environmental impacts of exploration for the development of oil and gas? Master, could you repeat the question, I'm sorry, Master. Can you? I'm sorry, Master. Can you repeat that question? I'm sorry about that. Yes. In perspective of air monitoring, what are the major environmental impacts of exploration for and the development of oil and gas? Okay. So the oil and gas industry, um, it, it will have its own, uh, as Reggie said air monitoring or air pollutants associated with this type of um, exploration. And it could be varied because it could depend, it depends on also whether it's exploration, whether it's development, for example, a refinery will have different um, air quality uh, parameters that can be tested, whereas a tank farm will have different ones. For example, for the tank farms that we have 
looked at on the sorting meter registration, we usually ask them to do the criteria pollutants, the ones that we mentioned previously. And we also look at VOCs. We also look at um, specific organics that may be related to that particular site. So it varies. It, it's a very um, broad question to answer in a short space of time. Okay. Um, the questions are coming in very quickly, so bear with me, please. There's another one. Mortality effects from the Council Society studies. Harvard Six Cities studies, California teachers studies, all indicate increased mortality at levels of PM10 below 20 UGM3 from lung cancer and cardiovascular disease. So would you be able to elaborate on that or give some further guidance? Well, um, there, there is a lot of evidence showing the impacts of particulate matter, especially on one's health. And that is why at the EMA, we are also partnering with other agencies, for example, the Ministry of Health and, the, and PAHO, to do studies for Trinidad to relate the health impacts um, and air quality. So although um, the air unit is five years old, but we have been doing a lot of research and we've been making um, a lot of, um, we've been doing a lot of collaborations with different agencies so that we can look at this link, this link of the health impact of air quality on, on TSAT. Okay. Thanks for this webinar from someone. You're most welcome. Can you possibly mention the instruments that are used at the AAQM stations? I'm asking because this semester we had one student using the mini vol sampler to monitor PM concentrations gravimatically for a research project. Okay. So the instruments that we use at the station, um, the brands include, yes, we do use um, high vol, um, not the mini vol but we use the high ball and we do use um, the method of a graphimetric um, analysis. We also use beta attenuation, scattered light spectrometry for the evaluation of uh, particulate matter. And we use ultraviolet fluorons for sulfur dioxide and for ozone. Um, for carbon monoxide, we use non dispersive infrared radiation method. Some of the um, Brands include um, Saladine and also the airport. But the, um, it's also to note that the mini ball sampler, um, we, we do accept uh, readings from that in, when we're looking at comparing it to the air pollution rules because it meets the US EPA standard for ambient air monitoring. Thank you. What about what is in the particulates? Example, trace metals in the fine PM absorbed organics from diesel fumes. Someone wants to That's a very some clarification on that. And um, it, it's, so, it, it's interesting because this morning we actually had a, a meeting with the university, um, or UWE, uh, where we are partnering with the chemistry department to do analysis of the filter tape from that June event, that Saharan event, that uh, large Saharan dust event in the month of June. So we are looking at um, analyzing the particulate, the actual, what is found in those uh, filter tapes. And you will hear more about that as um, this research and partnership continues. Thank you for this information session. Another question, can you indicate how can the air quality index be measured in areas that have small businesses such as straightening and painting or poultry or pig farms? Okay, so the air quality, as I would have mentioned before, so this is similar to the um, quarry question, right? We have uh, stations located at uh, Port of Spain, Central, and Tobago, but we do not have uh, specific uh, um, stations located at uh, 
areas where that we have small businesses with painting and poultry. How we do manage this is through the air pollution rules again, um, ensuring that uh, these small businesses register for sort emitter registration and if they require permits, and that is how we manage. Thank you. Um, AQI require real-time measurements, air toxins and organics indicator contaminant, contaminants um, can substitute, can be included in the suite of parameters measured. Well, currently the equipment that we use in our ambient air quality monitoring stations was real-time equip, um, equipment. As I said, it's very specific. Uh, we do it based on the criteria of pollutants and the range of pollutants that we currently have covers the most uh, the the ones that we are currently interested in. I'm seeing that you are asking if it can be included in the suite of parameters to be measured. Now, for our ambient air quality monitoring network, I'm not sure if that is something that we would consider, but we do look at organics and other air toxics when we are considering specific facilities under the air pollution rules by its sorting of the registration process and also the permitting process and also through the certificate of environmental clearance rule we when a facility or a proposed facility is um, getting look we look at the, the environmental impacts of the proposed pollutants from that facility and the conditions in that CP will also cover the ones that may be um, that may include the toxics, the air toxics and the organics. So to answer that question in a nutshell for our AQI, we currently will not be looking at including the organics and the toxics at this time. Thank you, Drina. Um, thank you for the insightful webinar. Um, can EMA consider a separate session to address monitoring best practices for industrial air emissions, example, stack monitoring? Well, thank you for that recommendation. And we would take it into consideration when planning other webinars. But we also do provide guidance in terms of the, when it is monitoring as requested, we do um, ask applicants to perform methodologies in alignment with the US EPA stack monitoring method and any other internationally recognized methods such as lethal heat and ISO. Thank you very much. What measures are being put in place to encourage persons and companies to become aware of the impact of their behaviors on air quality and to encourage change in behavior? Okay, so um, how we have approached this is through public awareness. Um, we have uh, started, we worked on a project for mini and micro um, operators for woodwork facilities, um, auto body garages, um, welding and commercial vehicular repairs, um, where we um, have plans um, to invite the owners of these facilities so that they can be made aware of the impact that they are having, the environmental impact that they are having, especially with, with respect to air pollution and how they can implement the best, best management practices and they will be how they can be compliant under the air pollution. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Given that climate change is now a looming threat are there any plans to monitor greenhouse gases? Well, the EMA currently, we have something called a knowledge management uh, system, which we use to do our greenhouse gas inventory for Trinidad and Tobago. So it's not specifically to measure the actual greenhouse gases, but the way that we, we, we do it currently is through the IPCC calculations, and this is under the Paris Agreement where various facilities within Trinidad and Tobago that falls into the category of energy manufacturing, etc., we actually uh, meet with them and they are so currently submitting their greenhouse gas uh, data to us, which we are using for our international report. 
Thank you. Um, one question here, how involved are EME or is EME with greenhouse gas? So greenhouse well, gases. Right, so greenhouse oh, gas, yeah. um, that specific um, Paris Agreement is under the ministry. However, the EMA works very closely with the ministry. As I said, the EMA actually is the, um, the host for that knowledge management system where we, we the air unit actually um, would be reviewing the greenhouse gas data for all these facilities within Trinidad and Tobago and will be compiling the inventory which would be sent to the ministry for our international reporting. And also we will be performing QA, QC measure uh, review on the data. Thank you. Um, we'll just entertain three more questions because we're about five minutes to one, five minutes to two, sorry. Will EMA consider establishing air monitoring stations in areas particularly affected by respiratory ailments? So uh, that is a difficult question to answer because persons who have respiratory ailments could be scattered throughout Trinidad and Tobago. And so as Shadi mentioned previously, we do have a criteria that we use to cite our station and one of one is based on sensitive receptors. So we do look at sensitive receptors, um, check so hospitals, hospitals schools. So we try to locate the stations within the vicinity of sensitive receptors. Uh, so at this point in time, um, we do try also to closely to residential communities. Um, the sources of pollutants. So, um, we also try to locate the stations close to sources, um, sources of emissions and pollutants. But we also need that information to say well where specific persons with respiratory ailments um, live, and we do have that information. Thank you very much. Um, and these last questions are coming from our Facebook viewers. Um, what is standard for carbon dioxide? What is standard for carbon dioxide? I'm sorry, um, standard as in the EMA standard for the acceptable levels? Um, this is the way the question came in. So I assume you might be able to interpret it in, in the way you think best. What is standard for carbon dioxide? I would just, what is the standard? What is the standard? Yeah. Okay, well, the standard for um, our eight hour average is 10,000 micrograms per cubic meter um, for the ambient air. Okay, thank you. And our last question, is gas flaring regulated in any way? Yes, and that will be under Certificates of Environmental Clearance rules. So those gas facilities would have, uh, most of them would have a Certificate of Environmental Clearance, which would consider this activity. Thank you very much. Um, is there anyone else who would like to pose a question in the chat? If not, we are running at 1.58. So I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this webinar, which was also live streamed on Facebook. Um, I would like to invite you to our second webinar, which will take place on Tuesday, the 28th of July. And this webinar will be addressing the way the, the role of the EMA in managing the air pollution. So thank you very much for being with us. Um, it was our first webinar and um, we thank you very much for being patient. And as we go, we would like to just leave you with a few thoughts, um, which would be to stay healthy, stay safe and wear a mask. Thank you very much.